Okay, so we're going to talk about musculoskeletal neurovascular assessment. And actually, uh, osteoporosis is on the next is in the next section, not on this one. Uh, but we're going to talk about fractured hip and total hip replacement. So our objectives, we're going to look at some key assessment factors for the musculoskeletal system, look at uh, some diagnostic tests and what you need to know as a nurse taking care of patients or having, who are having those diagnostic tests, and then specifically look at hip fracture repair or hip arthroplasty, which is joint replacement, uh, people that have had that surgery and how you're going to take care of them. So for assessment of whatever system we're talking about, history is part of the assessment that we do. We ask the patient questions about their history, what's led up to why they're coming into the healthcare system at this point. So if they've had any musculoskeletal injuries, we certainly want to ask about that. What's MVA? Motor vehicle accident. Motor vehicle accident. Uh, sports injuries, work-related injuries. If they've had previous hospitalizations, uh, we want to know about all of them, but specifically something related to their musculoskeletal system, fractures. And then some particular medications related to the musculoskeletal system. If people are taking calcium supplements, we want to know about that. What are NSAIDs? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. What's an example? Ibuprofen. Ibuprofen. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, or if they're taking other uh, osteoporosis medications or pain medications related to joint problems. Uh, I'm currently taking NSAIDs because I've got some kind of repetitive motion injury to my elbow, and it's, you know, it's related to mouse and laptop thing. Oh, it's driving me nuts. Sorry, a little sideline there. And then... Uh, Complementary medications or alternative medications, uh, those non-prescription kinds of things that patients might take that are uh, advertised on TV and in magazines and uh, sold often in, in general drug stores, but in supplement stores, you know, um, some of those, we're going to talk about those a little bit later, and actually Professor Kapoor is going to talk about those with you as well, kind of sifting through to see what's really effective what's not, what's dangerous, because patients are taking some things that are dangerous, because they're not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, so glucosamine and chondroitin are two uh, uh, substances that have been used a lot in joint issues, and previous research suggested that they were effective, but more current research coming out suggests that they don't make any difference for joint pain and joint problems, but people are still taking them. So, What's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, here's somebody headed for a musculoskeletal injury, don't you think? <clears throat> okay. So for subjective assessment, what kinds of things will you ask about? Don't look at the next slide. What do you think you'd ask a patient who comes in with a musculoskeletal issue? Are you having pain? Okay. And then we're going to talk, we're going to do a whole lecture on pain assessment, but, you know, what makes it better, what makes it worse? When did it start? All those kinds of questions. What's that? If there was an injury, uh -huh, the date of the injury, what kind of injury it was, uh, did they know what it's related to? Uh -huh. yeah, good. Do they feel any restriction in their movement? All those subjective kinds of things that we need to get that information from the patient themselves. So... Uh, I think we mentioned this before, chief complaint, that's why they're coming, and that's recorded in the patient's own words. So I'm here today because my elbow hurts, okay? I'll talk about me uh, as an example here. Yeah. When you write that down before mm -hmm. any specific information, do you have to say patient says and then patient says, or if you can that sound like that, just assume that the patient said it? Yeah, it depends on, on what format you're using. If you, if you are writing a narrative uh, record of your discussion with the patient and you start with this chief complaint, and you'll see this a lot of times, physicians include this a lot, um, if you, they'll often use the abbreviation CC, chief complaint, and then they'll
put it there. You, you know, you probably don't need quotation marks there. It's clear. We're talking about the chief complaint. That's the patient's view, you know. If we're using a SOAP format, again, the S is subjective. So we know that's the patient speaking. Now, if you want to put it in quotation marks, that just, it makes it really clear that that's what we're talking about. So there isn't any hard and fast rule about that. But, but the more clearly you communicate what's happening, the better. Because you might also have, under subjective, my elbow hurts. And by the way, you rarely have to say patient because that's who the documentation is about. But you might talk about the family. So say, say I was 10 years old and I came in and said my elbow hurts. And then you might record that the mother reports limited uh, movement. Okay. So then you don't need quotation marks because you're not exactly quoting her. You're just recording what she said. But it's still subjective because it comes from the mother. Does that make sense? And there you do have to indicate who you're talking about because it's not the patient anymore. Okay. So chief complaint, history of the present illness. I really noticed my uh, elbow bothered me this summer. I graded a lot of papers online this summer, and I think that I was doing so much laptop work that I did something to my elbow. That's when it started. Uh, let me go back there. And then you would ask more questions about that. So yeah, I really noticed it when I was moving my mouse around. I tried ibuprofen. It didn't work. Um, I uh, went and got a wireless mouse so I could position it where I wanted it to. So you would ask the patient all those questions about the history of the present illness. What's been going on with this particular condition? Then we'd want a description of how the rest of their musculoskeletal system is, if there's limitations in mobility, all of those kinds of things, what their occupation is, if they can perform their activities of daily living, so one of the things that I'm limited in is lifting stuff with my right arm because I just don't have the strength to be able to do that. I sometimes can't lift my coffee cup. How annoying is that? If there's pain, what their diet is, are they getting plenty of calcium, vitamin D, uh, anything else that might affect their musculoskeletal system? And then a review of systems. And we mentioned this before, that just because we think it's a musculoskeletal issue, we've got to go through the other systems and make sure that there's not some overlap somewhere. Now, if it's your elbow, the likelihood is there's not another system involved. But if it was your back, for example, you might have back pain. Well, that could be from an, a gastric ulcer could cause back pain. So we can't ignore that there might be other systems involved here. Okay, the most important thing when we're evaluating the musculoskeletal system is symmetry. And here's the perfect place where uh, we said this on the first day, I think. We need to know the patient's baseline, right? You need to know the patient's baseline in order to tell if something has changed or not. Well, with musculoskeletal, you have a built-in baseline for the patient, and that's the other extremity. So if I have a problem with this elbow, one of the things we have to do is assess my other elbow and see so we can compare right there and look and, and tell if there's differences or not. That's really helpful with swelling. So a patient comes and says, well, gosh, it looks like my hand is swollen. Well, let's look at your other hand and see what that looks like. And if they look the same, it's probably not an issue. Okay? So that symmetry, comparing the patient to themselves, is really important. Now, one of the key assessment parameters is CMS. Sometimes it's called CSM. It's the same thing. It's circulation, motion, and sensation. So uh, we're going to walk through how to do that assessment. But it tells us about the neurovascular sy or neuromuscular system and also the vascular system. So we get nerves, muscles, and, and vascular all in one bundle here. So when do we do CMS checks? Anytime we think that there's some impairment of the neurovascular musculoskeletal system. Now, again, you might work somewhere where there's a provider order to do CMS checks, but you don't have to have 
a provider order to do CMS checks. You can do them on your own, okay? Now, without looking at your slide, talk to your neighbor and think about some conditions or times you would want to have, want to do CMS checks, okay? Don't look ahead, though. Okay, what do you think? When would you do CMS checks? After surgery. After surgery. Now, would you do CMS checks after an appendectomy? Apart from your general assessment of a patient, is there any need to do CMS checks after an appendectomy? Not specifically, no. How about a fractured hip repair? Yes. So we're, we're thinking particularly of things that might interfere specifically with the musculoskeletal or vascular system. So an appendectomy in general is not going to do that. Actually, any kind of surgery in the general abdominal region, probably you don't have to specifically do CMS checks. Now, you might routinely check the patient's pulses every day in their extremities, but you don't have to do specific intentional CMS checks in those conditions. So, what else? Yeah. Yes. So, if we have a splint or a cast or a sling or some kind of procedure that we're doing for patients that might interfere with their circulation, motion, or sensation, or because of a injury that might interfere with that, we want to do CMS checks. After a stroke, you have a specific localized uh, issue, and so definitely you want to be doing CMS checks on the affected extremities after a stroke. Good. Trauma to an extremity. Uh, surgery on the spine, you want to do CMS checks. If it's upper spine, you want to do CMS checks to the, both the arms and legs. If it's lower spine, you want to do CMS checks to the legs. Okay, so anytime we're looking for some localized area of issue. So surgery, neurologic conditions like a stroke, interventions like casts or restraints, those kinds of things. So here are the things we check with CMS checks. With circulation, of course, the best indicator of circulation is the pulse, right? That tells you if blood is getting to that extremity. So we want to check pulses. So if, if we're worried about my CMS because of my elbow, we would check the pulse in my right arm. Now, to see if that pulse is normal or not, what are we going to do? Compare it to the left arm, okay? See if that's a normal pulse or not. And here we're not talking about heart rate. We're talking about the quality of the pulse. Is it nice and, nice and strong, or is it weak and thready, okay? Or is it bounding? Is it boom, boom, boom? So uh, the quality of the pulse. The temperature of the extremity. So if a patient, if you go up to a patient, and, and I'm going to assess her arm, and I think, gosh, this hand is cool. I wonder if that's what's going on, you know, what's going on. And then I feel the other hand, and it's cool, too. Maybe it's just the room, you know. It's not necessarily the patient. So that's why that comparing is so important. But if the person's not getting adequate circulation, what would you expect the extremity to be? Cool, okay? So if it's cool and it's the only place on the body that's cool, we're concerned about that. Uh, the color. So we want it to be flesh-toned for the patient. And so if we can uh, compare it to the other one, we can tell if there's a change there. And then capillary refill. You've already been doing that, right? We press on the... Now, you, usually we press on the nail bed, 
and see if it turns white and then release it and it should turn pink again. But if they have nail polish on, you can do you can, that's you can do the blanching that we talked about with the skin. So we can um, press just anywhere on the skin and see if it turns back to flesh colored. And again, in darker skinned uh, folks, that's harder to tell. So that's circulation. Motion, we want to check the movement, and we want to see if they can move it themselves or if there's limitations in their movement, and we want to assess their range of motion. Now, this is not doing exercises on them. This is assessing to see if they have some limitation in the movement of that joint. And then also assessing strength. And have you been doing pushing, pulling things? Having patients push against your hand or their foot? Okay. Then sensation, we want to see if they can feel when you touch them. So like somebody that has a cast on their arm, you would touch their fingers and say, can you feel this? Okay. Now, if you're not sure of their accuracy, you could have them close their eyes or turn their head away and then test them that way and see if they can tell when you're touching them or not. If we really want to know, we can use a sterile uh, pin or a needle and see their fine sensation by just uh, giving them, not sticking it in them, but just touching them with the tip of the needle. Paresthesias are abnormal sensations. So what's anesthesia? Absence of sensation, anesthesia. So para is abnormal. So paresthesia, abnormal sensations. That could be uh, numbness or tingling or a prickly sensation or a crawly sensation on their skin, uh, burning sensation, some kind of abnormal sensation. So we want to know about that. If people have paresthesias, something's wrong. We need to investigate further. And then certainly if they have pain, we want to know about that. So that's CMS. CMS. Those are CMS checks. And you can... Uh, Implement those anytime you suspect some issue with your patient's neuromuscular vascular system. So assess the CMS of your neighbor right now. Good. That's a great way to do that. Okay. Um, I just heard somebody ask, in, in testing the sensation, she had the uh, patient close their eyes, and then the nurse said, which finger am I touching? So that's a good way to do that so that you can identify how they're, how they're doing with that. Okay, so let's document our findings. So let's say the patient doesn't have any complaints of any issue related to this. So what's some objective things we would record? Okay, so uh, normal is a word that we want to avoid. It uh, doesn't communicate very well what we mean. So in this case, though, what we might say is that the pulses are intact and that if they were weak and thready or bounding, we would have documented that. But since they're neither of those, we, ju we can just say intact. That tells us that they're present and they're not abnormal. Okay, so pulse is intact. And we would want to say which ones like radial pulse or uh, pedal pulse or whatever pulse you're talking about, okay? What else? What's CO? Complains of or complaints of. So here there's no complaints. 
What else? CMS-wise. Full range of motion. Okay. Now, physical therapists have little devices that they can use to measure the range of motion. We're usually not doing that. So you could say limited range of motion or range of motion reduced by 50% or something like that if it was abnormal. But you can just say if it's normal, you can just say full range of motion. And again, we want to say where we're talking about. So if let's... Not that it's always about me, but let's go back to me here. Full range of motion, right elbow. So you need to say where you're talking about because you didn't check every single joint in that patient's body because I know you didn't do every one of their finger joints, right? So you have to say what you're talking about. What else? Okay. So if we're doing hands, uh, often the way we check strength is grips, right? So we could say... Grips equal and strong. Let me, let me rephrase that. Let's do grip strong and equal bilaterally. Okay? And you can just use bilat for that. No pain. Now, I don't... I don't know if we have to repeat that here and actually that's really that's a subjective thing so I guess I would say no complaints of pain up here okay capillary refill so what's a normal capillary refill less than three seconds so you can just say capillary refill you can say less than three seconds, or you can say that it's one second, or you can say that it's two seconds, however you want to do that. And you know how to do that, so you push, and then when you release it, you start counting. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. Okay. Uh, sensation intact. Uh, skin warm. Okay. Now, when, when you're a registered nurse, you can put all this together and say CMS intact. But as a three-week-old nursing student, <laughs> you have to give us this kind of information, okay, so that we know what you're, what you're thinking about when you say that. Bless you. Okay? All right. So... Here we have a patient who complains of numbness and tingling in the fingers on a casted arm. So what would you call that? Paresthesia. That's a paresthesia. And what do you think that means? Hmm? Cast is too tight. And what's it doing? Pressing on nerves. Nerves. This is a sensation. So it's pressing on the nerves, causing this abnormal sensation. What do you do about that? Okay, you can't recast it, so what are you going to do? Call the healthcare provider and see and report that information using the S bar technique. The patient's complaining of paresthesias in his right arm. That's the situation, okay? The background might be that. You know, you recall the patient had a fracture and had a cast put on this morning at 8 a.m. It's now noon, and they're complaining of paresthesia. And then all the rest of the CMS, you would report all the rest of that, uh, complaining of pain, the uh, fingers are cool and pale, uh, the pulses are intact or they're not intact or whatever. You'd give all that information. Uh, your assessment and recommendation. I'm concerned about the cast. Would you come in and look at the patient and see what we need to do about it? Okay. How much delay is, is reasonable, do you think, in reporting a change in, in CMS? Zero. <laughs> if there's a change in CMS in a patient, we've got to report that right away. Um, this patient who has paresthesias on the casted arm, they can lose their arm if we don't get that corrected. So we've got to report that right away. Yeah. 
So thank you for asking that. So all of you need to go back and look at your practicum course syllabus because there's a whole page in there about SBAR. So it's not, we talked about it in this class, but that's the other class syllabus. But you have to go look at that, okay, and review that SBAR. We, we had some in our class, but it's a verbal reporting technique. It's not a documentation technique. Now, you probably document most of that same stuff, but SBAR is really a format that we use for verbal report primarily. You might see places where they actually use that as a written report handoff to the next shift or something, but it's really a verbal reporting method. Okay. Oh, it's 9.20. Let's stop and take a break. We'll come back in 10 minutes. <laughs>